Hello! Welcome to this video on learning. Here we're going to emphasize a type of learning known as non-associative learning. Let's start out with a definition. We can define learning as a relatively permanent change in performance potential caused by certain kinds of experience. Now, there are a couple of points to notice about this. In particular, we notice that we have a emphasis on performance potential and also an emphasis on the fact that this change will be relatively permanent as opposed to very temporary. And we're also going to point out that it's caused by certain kinds of experiences but not others. So with that as a definition to start our conversation, why don't we take a look at some potential critical thinking questions. For example, why does the definition above stress performance potential rather than simply performance? As psychologists, we measure performance, that is, we measure behavior, and yet here we're asked to consider performance potential rather than performance itself. Here's another critical thinking question. Would you consider dark adaptation, which occurs when you sit in a dark movie theater, to be a form of learning? Why or why not? Let's now proceed to a couple of important reflections on learning. Learning is not directly observed by the senses but instead must be inferred from the behavior of organisms. So we wouldn't say, for example, draw me a picture or play me the sound of learning. Learning is not something that we directly see or hear. And there's an important analogy that we might have when we think about some work that's been done in other scientific fields on other phenomena that are not directly observable but must be inferred. So for example, gravity is also inferred rather than directly observed by the senses, just like learning. So, Physicists can test falsifiable theories of gravity by experiments on the behavior of objects. Even though physicists can't directly observe gravity, they can infer gravity from the behavior of objects. As a parallel, we as psychologists can test falsifiable theories of learning by experiments on the behavior of organisms. Okay, with those opening remarks duly noted, why don't we go ahead and learn something about the different varieties of learning. And across many videos, we'll see that there are actually many different broad categories of learning. The first one that we're going to consider is something called non-associative learning. And it has a fairly complicated definition. Let's take it just one sentence at a time. We can define non-associative learning as a relatively permanent change in the strength of the response to a single stimulus caused by repeated exposure to that stimulus. And then there's a qualifying sentence as well, and that goes like this. Changes due to such factors as sensory adaptation or fatigue or injury do not qualify as non-associative learning. So we have some idea about what this is. It's a relatively permanent change in the strength of the response to a single stimulus caused by repeated exposure to that stimulus. But we wouldn't count sensory adaptation in among the instances of non-associative learning, nor would we count fatigue or injury in among those examples. There are two broad categories, though, even within this domain of non-associative learning. One category is called habituation, and you might see the root word habit in there. Its synonym is desensitization. And here, many students who have had some prior classes in psychology, or perhaps they know somebody who's gone through systematic desensitization, would recognize that desensitization is something that many clinical psychologists and other therapists might use on something like simple phobias. Maybe somebody has a fear of a particular stimulus, and we need to make them less sensitive to that, so we can have them habituate or desensitize by, for example, giving them repeated exposure. And this habituation, or desensitization, is one subcategory in the larger category of non-associative learning. We will see examples of associative learning in a future video, but we won't get ahead of ourselves here. Let's contrast habituation, or desensitization, with its obvious opposite, which is sensitization. And these two make up two important subcategories of non-associative learning. Let's take them one at a time. Let's begin with habituation. And again, we'll start out with yet another definition. And we can describe or define habituation as a form of non-associative learning in which an organism decreases or ceases to respond to a stimulus after repeated presentations. So we can think of this as somewhat inhibitory. We're developing the habit of being exposed to this stimulus, and we become less responsive to it. It's also called desensitization, 
And this habituation and desensitization are distinct from simple sensory adaptation, which is a temporarily reduced ability to detect stimuli. Let's give you a reminder of a simple sensory adaptation so you can contrast it with habituation. So, for example, we've previously considered the case where somebody in a psychology experiment might be asked to hold their hand in room temperature water for a minute or so and give us some kind of subjective rating about the water's temperature. And then we have the same participant hold their hand in either very cold water or very hot water, and we're having them adapt. And then after that adaptation period, we might bring them back to the room temperature water one more time and see how their behavior has changed after we've adapted their sensory system. Now, that adaptation will be something that occurs on the order of maybe a few minutes, and it only lasts for a few minutes or even less. It might last only for seconds. Remember that habituation is a form of non-associative learning, and so it's a relatively permanent form of learning, as contrasted with simple sensory adaptation. Okay, as a learning check, it's always good to consider these potential pop quiz questions, and you might ask yourself if you can provide a novel example of habituation from everyday life and explain your choice. Let's consider another potential pop quiz question as well. In your own words, explain why habituation might be evolutionarily adaptive. And to help you think through this problem, I have a picture here as a prompt. So just take a look at the picture. Imagine that you're any one of the people in this picture and ask yourself, why would it be the case that habituation might be evolutionarily adaptive? Okay, why don't we move on and we'll consider the other main subcategory of non-associative learning, which is sensitization. We can define sensitization as a non-associative learning process in which repeated administrations of a stimulus result in the progressive amplification, and I'll highlight that here, of a response. So this is basically the opposite of what we had in habituation, where there was a cessation of responding or a reduction in responding. Now we're getting an amplification of the response. Here's one simple example. Fast food workers sometimes become sensitized to the call for large fry amidst the buzz of the task-irrelevant auditory stimulation around them. They become more sensitive to that particular phrase after repeated exposure to it. This is an example of sensitization. Okay, let's conclude with one final slide on the topic of sensitization. Here we have the picture of Eric Kandel, who earned a Nobel Prize in 2000 for research on the physiological basis of sensitization and memory in this species, Aplesia californica. And, of course, he won this prize in 2000, but he had actually performed the work that was being recognized in the year 2000 many decades earlier. It was actually a lifelong attempt to try to understand the neural basis of sensitization. And what's fascinating to me, and I hope to you also, is that he used a broad variety of animals, but often he was relying on this animal that we know as the sea slug, Aplesia californica. Our last common ancestor with Aplesia californica would have occurred more than 500 million years ago. Despite this, the underlying neural mechanisms that mediate sensitization in this animal are the very same ones that mediate sensitization in you and me. And toward the end of the series, we'll have a further conversation about the neural basis of sensitization and, in fact, all forms of learning. But here we'll just note that the underlying neural mechanisms have been preserved for millions of years. Thanks for watching.